Let's talk about food and reflux. You may have heard about standard trigger foods for GERD. Avoid fats, fried and spicy foods, citrus fruits, tomatoes, onions and garlic, chocolate, stop drinking coffee, alcohol, and carbonated beverages. But will avoiding these foods work? The science is conflicting, and this approach is no longer supported by the American Medical Association's continuing medical education program. Here's a quote. Routine global elimination of foods that can trigger reflux is not recommended for the treatment of GERD. I'll add a couple of links in the comments below. But here's my point. The fact that trigger food diets didn't work doesn't mean that dietary intervention won't work, but it does mean going back to the drawing board. And that's what I've done. I'm here to share with you a different approach that stopped my own chronic reflux and led to a new way of looking at this condition. I'm Norm Robillard, founder of the Digestive Health Institute and the creator of the Fast Track Diet. Today's topic is beyond trigger foods for GERD. About 60 million people in the U.S. alone suffer from painful symptoms of acid reflux on a regular basis. Typical symptoms of reflux include heartburn, belching, bloating, abdominal pain, cough, regurgitation, sour taste in the mouth, sore throat, hoarseness, laryngitis, asthma-like symptoms, and sinus irritation. And smoking, hiatal hernia, obesity, pregnancy, even tight-fitting clothes can make the symptoms worse. Acid reflux occurs when acid and other contents in the stomach escape into the esophagus and beyond. Chronic acid reflux often leads to damage because the esophagus and other affected tissues are not protected by the same thick mucus layer that coats the inside of our stomach. And the result is painful irritation, which can lead to esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, even esophageal cancer. Persistent damaging reflux is referred to as gastroesophageal reflux disease. But reflux may also cause severe irritation of the throat and vocal cords, a condition referred to as laryngopharyngeal reflux, or LPR. The most rational approach for the treatment of GERD, including LPR, is to stop the reflux so acid and other st stomach contents stay where they belong. But how do we do that? You may have heard that reflux occurs when the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES, it's a group of muscles that sits at the top of the stomach and is supposed to keep it closed, when these muscles become weak or inappropriately relax. But does this really happen? Is this really the cause of GERD, or have we been looking at this the wrong way? Let me share with you a story about my own chronic reflux and how I resolved it. I ended up writing two books on this, Heartburn Cured and Fast Track Digestion Heartburn. In these books, I propose a new and different underlying cause of reflux that better fits the facts, facts and does not depend on a weakened or relaxed, inappropriately relaxed LES. For 15 years, I suffered with GERD and occasional IBS symptoms. I took PPIs or proton pump inhibitors, H2 blockers, but they didn't give me adequate relief. One thing I did notice made a difference is there was a strong connection between my symptoms and carbohydrates in my diet. In other words, my symptoms improved dramatically when I cut carbs. And I found myself wondering why. Being a microbiologist, I knew that we have 100 trillion microbes in our intestines. And these microbes get most of their energy by fermenting foods that we don't digest and absorb. Now there's only three food groups, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And most of our gut bacteria pre uh, prefer the carbohydrates as their main fuel source. And when they ferment carbs, they can produce a lot of gas. In fact, only 30 grams of unabsorbed carbohydrates allow bacteria to produce more than 10 liters of hydrogen and other gases. In fact, there's so much flammable gas in our intestines at times, there have been well-documented cases of explosions during intestinal surgery. 
The basic idea I had is that some of us may lose the ability to efficiently digest and absorb carbohydrates in our diet, thus overfeeding these gas-producing microbes. This leads to excessive intestinal gas, which creates a lot of pressure in the intestines, and that gas pressure works its way into the stomach. This is well known to occur. It's well documented. GERD patients have higher intragastric pressure. This gas pressure drives reflux. It pushes the LES open, a little like dropping a Mentos into a bottle of Coke. This is a very different idea than a weakened or an LES that relaxes at the wrong time. If my theory stands, by the way, there's a lot of evidence for this in my books, we have been going about things all wrong. We need to focus on reducing hard to digest but fermentable carbohydrates in our diet. In other words, we need to put our microbes on a diet, resulting in less gas. Now, how do we translate this idea into what we shouldn't eat for GERD and what we should eat? The simplest and best way to address reflux is to reduce, but not necessarily eliminate, hard to digest fermentable carbohydrates in our diet. And an easy way to do this is to use the fast track diet. The fast track diet is based on a three pillar approach. The first one is dietary, limiting these hard to digest but fermentable carbohydrates. And what are those? Lactose, fructose, and polymers of fructose, fiber, resistant starch, and sugar alcohols, with the exception of erythritol, which is one gut friendly sugar alcohol. But knowing the amounts of these carb types in a given food or drink is almost impossible. The fast track diet solved this challenge. Each food or drink is rated based on a fermentation potential or FP point system I created. The lower the FP value for a given food and serving size, the lower the symptom potential. It's that simple. The second pillar or second part of the diet is identifying and addressing underlying causes that are specific to your case. There's a, at least 25 or 30 of these. And the third part or the third pillar is focusing on pro-digestion behaviors and practices that will help you improve your digestion even when your diet isn't perfect. Now, back to the trigger foods for GERD. When you look at things through this new lens, you may notice that many of these trigger foods contain these hard to digest fermentable carbohydrates. Fats often get the blame, but fats themselves don't trigger reflux. I'll add some links about this. However, many fats are linked to high carb foods. For instance, French fries are con considered fatty, but they're made from potatoes. Depending on the potato, there can be a lot of resistant starch there, the type of potato. Fried fish or chicken is considered fatty, but these foods are often coated with a batter made from corn or wheat, which has a higher amount of fiber and resistant starch. Citrus is high in sugar and fibers. Tomatoes, particularly tomato sauces, contain added sugar and other carbs. Onions and garlic, that's a special case. This family of vegetables is relatively lower in carbs, but those carbohydrates a composed of fructooligosaccharide, which is a FODMAP, like a fiber, hard to digest, very fermentable. Chocolate is high in sugar and high in fiber. Coffee contains some fiber, and many people add sugar and sweetened creamers to their coffee. Alcohol is not a trigger, but beer, sweet wines, and sweetened drink mixes are much higher in sugar and carbs. Likewise, carbonated beverages are often high high carb or high in sugar. Limiting these higher carb versions of trigger foods makes sense, but here's the problem. The trigger food diet doesn't go far enough. Other foods high in fermentable carbs include various grains, legumes, breads, and desserts, which are not necessarily on the trigger food list. For more information on the fast track diet, you can download my free ebook at digestivehealthinstitute.org. For questions and support, you can visit us at the Fast Track Diet Facebook group. For individualized help, you can contact me directly through digestivehealthinstitute.org. So, thanks for watching. Until next time.